Thank you so much for your welcome. It's so brilliant to be here. I've really been looking forward to this evening. What a band. Wasn't that worship fantastic? It feels like I'm sharing the stage with Mumford and Sons. It was just amazing, just brilliant. And uh, worship is such a key thing. We'll be looking at that a little bit later. But it's such a joy to be here. And before I really get into the uh, subject matter for tonight, what we're talking about, I just sense the Lord want me to say uh, one or two things just about the significance of this church in this city. It's always a joy to preach God's word. It's always a joy to be with God's people. But there's a special joy in being invited to a place that has been raised up by the Lord, anointed by him, shown his favor, given his blessing, because you are so faithful to bless the city. And actually, our relationship with Woody's goes back, we've been in Bristol two and a half years, but our relationship goes back beyond that. When we were in our previous church in in Bath, that's the correct way of pronouncing it, by the way, (laughs) put an R in it, it becomes a Swiss theologian. Um, But actually, when we were there, we had connections, and we were seeking to mold a church that would be both word and spirit focused. And we wanted to make sure that the quality of our worship enabled a platform for God to reign in our midst. And there was a, there was a period of, um, of time where we didn't have sufficient people leading worship. And time and again, Colts came over to help us uh, lead worship. And he was such a blessing to us. I don't know whether he's here tonight, but uh, I just want to say what a great, well, you know, uh, how great a guy Coles is, and he was just such a blessing to us. And then uh, somebody who was working here, Tim Buckley, some of you will remember him, uh, came and joined our staff over there. It was a joy. And, you know, there's something, and I want to say this, and uh, I know uh, Rob will probably never invite me back, but you know, Rob is a father in God to this city. And God has raised him up. Uh, God has uh, seen his humility, his passion in prayer for the city. And uh, Rob is one of those leaders And Woody's is one of those churches that other churches, like Christ Church and the rest, look to because God has raised you up, God has raised him up to model something about the recovery of the biblical truth of what God wants to do in our city and in our nation. It's such a joy to be with you. There are certain truths like those that people like Rob and churches like Woody's can't say of themselves, of course. So it feels really important that others who can speak those truths do so when they get the opportunity. So thank you for giving me uh, that opportunity this evening. For those who are timing the sermon, that wasn't part of it. (laughs) It's just exciting to be able to um, kick off a series and give some sort of overview of Ezra. And what I want to do this evening is literally just to give you a sense of the shape of how Ezra works and then to answer a couple of questions. The question that I've been asked to address is, How did Ezra restore biblical faithful living, walking the line, and what can we learn from him? So in a sense, we're asking the question, what are the marks that we can learn from Ezra of a healthy church that's dependent on God, that is sold out for him, and that is working to see his kingdom come? And inevitably, from a book, the length of uh, Ezra, there's 10 chapters, there will be a number of things Please don't feel you've got to remember everything because the way that these things work is the Holy Spirit may just touch your heart or your life in one particular area that may be early on, may be late on, and you'll just know from the Lord in your spirit that that's the truth that the Lord wants to work with you this evening. As Dave said, there'll be um, time for ministry uh, later. When you're looking at this, um, at this period, this season in the life of God's people in the Old Testament, Ezra and Nehemiah clearly are key people. The other two main characters, Zechariah and Haggai, they are the two key prophets who are operating at this time. And Ezra is an interesting book because it's 10 chapters long, but Ezra himself only makes an appearance in chapter 7, 80 years after the first return of the exiles that he's recorded in verse 1 of the first chapter. And many scholars believe that not only did Ezra write the book of Ezra, but he wrote the books of Chronicles as well. And one of the things um, Philip read, those closing verses from two Chronicles. And the very last verses are identical to the way that Ezra opens. I want to uh, begin just with a few broad brushstrokes of truth to which Ezra points before we look at some of the detailed lessons that we can learn about what it looks like 
to be a healthy church dependent on God and his purposes. And the first thing is that God controls world events. Is everybody in agreement with me on that? God controls world events. We'll see up on the screen the first verse of the first chapter of Ezra. And we read this. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and also to put it in writing. Another little scripture, I love this, from Isaiah 5, 26, talking about the Lord God. He He whistles for those at the ends of the earth. Here they come swiftly and speedily. The Hebrew for that, God whistling for the nations, is similar to what you might do if you own a dog and it's strayed off and you say, come come here. And that's the sense the nations, the great kings, whether they're called Cyrus or Obama, whether the land is in the east or in the west, the nations come to heal at the call of God. And one of the things that uh, I know here at Woodies you're very familiar with, I'm not going to teach into it at all, but just reference it, is this whole idea of the one world, two realms. The world in which we live, the world that we can see and touch and everything around us, but beyond that, the spiritual realm that is even more real than what we can see. And it is that realm to which this truth points. And actually, we can see God's hand at work over the centuries in the life of God's people. Now, my apologies. Rob is standing guard by the door. Nobody's allowed out for the next little bit, but I just need to do a quick history lesson to set this in context. Some of you struggle. Um, Inevitably, there's always people who don't uh, um, uh, go with the history, but let's just look because I think it will be an encouragement. I'm going to have a screen on the, uh, a slide on the screen with some dates. Just take through to see where we go. 1020 B.C., That's the time that Israel effectively becomes a nation state. It has its first king, Saul. And for the next 90 years, Israel is a unified nation under three kings. We know their names, many of us, Saul, David, Solomon. In 930, the kingdom splits. It splits neatly and geographically into north and south. Confusingly, the north carries on being called Israel. The south is called Judah. And those two different kingdoms continue. And effectively, the whole story of one and two kings, one and two chronicles, is telling us the history of the kings in the north and in the south. We're used to the phrase superpowers in our world. A few years ago, in my um, younger days, Russia and America together. Now, America seems to be the superpower. In these days, there were two superpowers, Assyria in the north, Egypt in the south. And all other nations related to them in one way or another. And in 721 uh, BC, Assyria, the northern kingdom, took control of the northern kingdom of Israel. Its capital was Samaria. And effectively, the ten northern tribes disappear from human history. They never return to their land. They're never heard of again. They never play a part in God's people. We get echoes, fascinatingly, in John's gospel. You remember the story of Jesus at the well with the woman in Samaria? And all the centuries of discord and and conflict between the, the Judah in the south and the Israel in the north play out as she talks to Jesus. 605 is the next one, one of the most important battles in the ancient world. 605, the Battle of Carchemish. This was the battle where the Babylonians took on the Assyrians and the Egyptians together, routed them, and Babylon remained then as the world's only superpower. In actual fact, the Bible references this in 2 Chronicles 25. We find that Egypt to fight at Carchemish, and Josiah, the king of Judah, actually went into uh, to try to prevent that battle. Now, after this, Babylon was in the ascendancy and all other states related to it. And Babylon's way of controlling its empire and its vassal states was effectively to invade, to take the cream of society, to take them into exile, and effectively to neuter the government and the leadership so that those states, no longer led independently, could provide um, finance and other things for the empire. 597, Nebuchadnezzar, he comes to Jerusalem and he carries off some of the leading citizens. That's when Daniel would have gone into exile. Four more kings, puppet kings really, are left on the throne in in Jerusalem. 
and the last of those rebels finally against Nebuchadnezzar and the full wrath of Babylon descends. 586, Jerusalem is destroyed, the temple is burnt to the ground. It's what we read about in a few moments ago. 539, the last date, you're not going to get any more dates from me this evening, brings us to the point where we join the story. And all this history is in God's hands. Because in 539, the Babylonian Empire collapses. Persia comes in. Cyrus II, the Great, takes over. And you can still read on the famous Cyrus Steely. We'll see these words on the screen. The idols which lived in the cities I brought back to their places. All their inhabitants I gathered and let them return to their dwellings. In other words, Cyrus overturned the previous policy and encouraged the nations to go back and to rebuild. And our Bible says all of that was purposed by God himself. Our God rules the nations. So let's just um, move on. The second thing really is that God always reveals his plans through the prophetic. And it's just a wonderful sense of freedom coming into a church where I know the gift of prophecy is honored, the role of prophets is honored, and your leadership seeks to follow the prophetic leading of God through his word. If we go back, uh, however far we want to go back, God had warned his people, even before they came into the land, that actually if they were unfaithful, they would face exile. I think we're jumping a a, a slide, but there's a a verse from Leviticus 18.27. This is one of many that I could have chosen. If you defile the land, it will vomit you out. Isaiah 5 talking about everything that the people had, harps, lyres at their banquets, and so on. But they have no regard for the deeds of the Lord, no respect for the work of his hands. Therefore, my people will go into exile. And uh, later in the prophet Jeremiah, on the next screen, uh, you'll see that the Lord Almighty says, because you've not listened to my words, I will summon. Note how he describes Nebuchadnezzar, the undisputed king of the world. Nebuchadnezzar, my servant. And then there's this prophecy that the exile will last for 70 years. And that's something that we'll come back to in a little while. So when God speaks in the prophetic, what is our response as his people? And this is a critical thing that we need to learn. And I'm sure that's a a lesson well taught and learnt already here. But just to uh, go over it again, that when God speaks a prophetic word, either at this sort of national or transnational level, or when God speaks a word of prophecy into the life of a church, or when God speaks a word of prophecy into the life of a group or a family or an individual, how do we respond? And actually from Scripture we learn that our response is not just sitting back saying, marvelous, the Lord has spoken, let's wait until all the good things come. Actually, we enter a sort of divine human cooperative with the Lord where, having heard the word of prophecy, we pray into it, we press into it, we work for it. We partner with the Lord in seeing that prophetic word come into being. And uh, I know we're not yet in the text of um, Ezra, and some of you will be getting alarmed, but just very briefly, let's have a reference to Daniel 9. Now, Daniel, remember, had uh, gone into exile in Babylon about 10 years before Jerusalem was finally destroyed. And he is um, in the first year of uh, Darius, who's king over the Babylonian Empire, and he is reading the prophet Jeremiah. And he sees there his own experience as the exile has begun. He's 10 years in, and he's in the prophet Jeremiah, and he's reading that Jeremiah had prophesied that it would last for 70 years, this exile. And so what does Daniel do? Verse 3, I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him, in prayer and petition, in fasting, in sackcloth and ashes. And then verse four onwards, this marvelous prayer of confession. And this is the response of God's people to the prophetic word, whether it's in your own life or whether it's in the life of your church or your community or your people. God speaks. We don't sit back and simply wait for it to happen. We press into it. We pray into it. We get real with God in terms of confession. If it's a a word that requires repentance, We get real and we do that. And we see their belief. We see the importance of listening to God and how important listening is. I mean, we all know that humanly. You know, Jackie and I have been married just shy of 10,000 days. And uh, 
I know I still haven't learned it properly. At breakfast this morning, Jackie said to me, Paul, you're just not listening properly. Or something like that. Anyway, <laughs> you know, the, the, the point is, listening is so significant. And if we are to be a people of the prophetic, we have to listen. We have to find time corporately and privately to set aside time to listen and give attention to what the Lord is saying. And then we submit to the Lord. We pray, we fast, we repent, we act. Let's see then, in these closing minutes of this talk, what we can learn, lessons in spiritual health. How does a people of God walk the line? How do we pursue biblical faithfulness? How do we make sure that we live according to his purposes? I've got a few things. Some of you will have had notes, I think, handed to you. Um, I'm just going to see how far I get uh, before my time uh, runs out. And these are just some snapshots through Ezra. And again, allow the Lord to bring alive in your spirit the things that are particularly significant for you. The first thing, chapters 1 and 2, the power of sacrificial giving. You'll see a couple of slides. We can just roll through them. But in the first chapter, this is the people in exile supporting financially the people who are going to go back to rebuild Jerusalem. This may be analogous in our day to the seed corn funding a church like Christ Church puts into St. Bart's as we plant a church uh, in there. You've probably heard about that a year or so ago. And then in Ezra 2, when the people arrived, they themselves gave. And you know, this, this whole sense of sacrificial giving is an absolutely key one for God's people. And that's always a challenge. It's a particular challenge in my own denomination because when it comes to giving, most Anglicans will stop at nothing. And um, so we have to work maybe just that little bit harder. C.S. Lewis said in Mere Christianity that if as a Christian you're spending as much on luxuries as the world around you, you're probably not giving sacrificially. I think that's a challenge the church corporately and individually needs to hear. Secondly, every member ministry, as you read through Ezra, one of the things I'd encourage you to do as you're going to be looking at Ezra and Nehemiah is read the whole of each book at a sitting. You'll get a sweep, a sense of the overview. And you'll find in chapters 2 of Ezra, chapter 8 of Ezra, chapter 10, and again in Nehemiah, there are some of the Bible's lists. And you know, the temptation is just say, oh, you know, all these ancient names. Just go over them. Okay, we'll do that if that's what you want to do. But just register the fact that the Holy Spirit inspires the authors of Scripture to set down at various points within uh, Scripture as a whole these lists of individuals. And they are not simply boring history. They remind us that God knows every name. You know, I can see some of your faces uh, this evening. Some of you are in shadow. I know hardly any of you. I can't put a name to the vast majority, 90 plus percent of you, but God can. You're listed. You're not overlooked. You're not insignificant. It doesn't matter what part you feel you play in the life of Woody's or if you're a visitor in whatever church you come from. You are significant. And none of us lacks value because God has stated that our value is equal. Our value is the life of his son. That's how much you're worth. So if you're ever tempted to think of yourself as insignificant, no part to play, do remember these rather dull lists of scripture. Individuals are significant. The real focus of kingdom ministry is people and every member of the church family has a part to play. That's why Paul, it's not on the screens, but uh, you'll be familiar. Now you are the body of Christ, and each of you has a part to play. Thirdly, the priority of worship. We see in Ezra 3, verses 2 to 3, first thing they did, before they did anything else, was to set up an altar, because the altar symbolized where God was to be worshipped. And if you read on in Ezra 3, you'll see that a regular pattern of worship was established. Note that they worship despite their fear 
of the surrounding peoples. You don't need me to tell this, but I'm going to state it anyway because it's important that we recognize it. There is a battle for worship in the life of God's church today. Anybody agree? Anybody sense that? There is a battle for worship. You know, when we give these guys a round of applause up on stage, when we, um, when we rejoice that God has given such gifts to those who lead us in worship, we're not simply talking about singing nice songs and that nice fuzzy feeling. These guys are leading us into battle. You read the Old Testament, when the people of Israel went into battle, who went first? The band. Ah. So when two of them come back on later, you'll know the reason. No, I mean, that's the, that's the case. There is a battle for worship today. I guess um, all church leaders have their funny stories of things that happen to them. A friend of mine, who's an Anglican vicar, um, was uh, introducing change. Why do we do it? Are Anglican vicars and change? I just don't know. It's like one of those, those B-horror movies where somebody wearing far too little goes down into the dungeon where they know that 13 other of their friends have just been brutally murdered. And you're saying, that, don't do it. It's a bit like that with Anglican vicars and change, but we do. And this friend of mine was, was uh, leading change. And on Easter Day a few years ago, he'd made some changes to the service by introducing a band to a service where there hadn't been a band before. And at the end, somebody came up to him and was obviously really quite uh, uh, upset and said these words. If Jesus could see what you're doing to this church, he'd turn in his grave. <laughs> you couldn't write that. You just could not write that. But let me tell you, there is a battle for worship. And even in a church like Wood is, there will be a battle for worship. Some of us, we come, I just loved it. It's Rob, wasn't it, who's leading? Is leading? Was it Rob? Robin. Thank you. Okay, Robin. Two syllables. Great. And I loved what he said about the fact that sometimes, you know, we don't feel it, and yet we do it because it's true. We do it because it's what God's worth. We do it because he gave everything for us. We do it because God deserves it. We do it because we speak truth. And we do it because it speaks not just in the earthly realm, but the heavenly realm. So to say that Jesus is Lord is a political act. When we worship, I love what Robin, I've got his name right now, what Robin said about there is no other name. That is a political statement. It speaks into the heavenly realms that every usurper of the one throne that only has one person with the worth and the value and the right to occupy it, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb who was slain, all other usurpers be gone because that throne belongs to Jesus alone. There is no other name. And that's what worship is about. But worship also does stuff for us. I meant to bring an empty two-liter lemonade, you know, you've seen two-liter lemonade bottles or whatever, and you know when you get into the end and you sort of squeeze them, and they get to a point where they don't come back into shape, and they're just bent. And you need, the only way you can get back is to pour more in, and that's what worship does for us. I don't know about you, my life is always getting bent out of shape, stuff that happens. And worship recalibrates the reality for me. It begins to ease out the kinks in my brokenness and my fallenness. As I recalibrate on him, something of my own reality comes back into shape. Way back, this is going slightly off piece now, but when Moses meets God at the burning bush and he says to God, who are you? Do you notice that God's response is not to give Moses a detailed biography of who Moses is, but say, I am who I am. Because our identity, our shape, our fullness is taken from the reality of who God is. And that's what we proclaim in worship. By proclaiming who God is, we have a sense of who we are in his presence. Worship has to be a priority. Make May the 19th a priority in your diary because going public on, in Castle Park is a massive statement in the spiritual realms. Christchurch Clifton has canceled its evening service for maybe the first time 
celebration plays such a big part. As you're reading Ezra and Nehemiah, just note the times that the word celebrate occurs. Uh, I, I know enough, I believe, to know that wood is as a church of celebration. You celebrate God's goodness. We need to move on. Emotional reality, no pretending. This I would say, um, and I simply offer this because I know that you pray for us, Rob and Pam and Dave and Tim and the team. Just, we just have had such a welcome, such a sense of being prayed for. And if you're praying for Christchurch, I think this is, is something of where we are. This was where the foundation of the temple was laid. You've got people there, of course, who remembered the great and glory days of the previous temple. You've got people who remembered what it looked like, what it felt like. And here, if you can just look, uh, we've got um, Ezra 3, 11 to 13. And if you just look at verse 13, there's this great shout of praise that goes up because of what God is doing. And yet there's also a great sound of weeping from those who remember what was there before. And without over-egging it, I'd you know, just say for your prayers, I think this is something of Christ Church's journey at the moment. There is both the shout of praise at the sense of what God is doing. We're in the midst of a weekend with a team from Bethel, as Dave mentioned earlier, and we're just seeing extraordinary things at the hands of God, and we're setting up a shout of praise. And yet, Christ Church is in a season of change, and there are many for whom it's a cause of weeping. And actually, that's part of the key thing. I loved what Dave said. I mean, really, I, I feel so much of my sermon was pre-preached this evening. It's wonderful. It's a bit like being Blue Peter. Here's one I prepared earlier. It's fantastic. <laughs> you know what Dave said at the beginning about being a community where people can raise a shout of joy if they've got a testimony of God's goodness, and people can ask for prayer if they're in trouble. That's what church should be. As Paul says to the Romans, you rejoice with those who rejoice. You mourn with those who mourn. The shout of praise and the sound of weeping should be continual refrains within the language and the experience of the people of God. And one of our dangers as evangelicals, as word and spirit, charismatic, whatever labels you want to, to put on yourself or your church, one of our dangers is that we find no place for lament. And, and, and there are people here tonight whose song is uh, maybe joy is, is there, but actually the major key is lament. Is there a space for people to lament in your churches? You know, if churches get into a position where you have to present as perfect to get through the door, where every conversation has to be about how wonderful everything is, that's no longer church. It's become a club. And unless there is the place for the voice of lament, the sound of weeping mingling with the shouts of praise, that's a warning sign. And Ezra led people into this emotional reality. Yes, it may be raw. Yes, it may be uncomfortable. Yes, it may be messy. But actually, the spirit blows where it wills. And we need to partner with him. Golly, I'm running out. But yeah, let's, let's scan through. Opposition to the things of God, spiritual warfare. Let's just face the reality. When you come to faith in Jesus Christ, you enter a war zone. You're both a combatant and part of the territory that God is wanting to have. And there are techniques, I'm not going to go through them, but uh, if you want to download the notes later, you'll be able to do so. The prophetic is really significant. Let's just have a look if you can find the slide. Sebastian, I think it is, is doing a great job keeping up with me. Ezra 5, 1 to 2. And this just references the significance of the prophets, Zechariah and Haggai. And the prophetic will always result in a shift of dynamic. When the prophetic comes in power, it affects a dynamic shift. It causes a pause, it causes a change of direction, something moves because of the prophetic. I know you don't, but never ever take the risk of, silen of silencing the prophetic in your midst. Those are the people who have a particular responsibility and maybe an office within the church of hearing God's voice so that something may be different, maybe initiating a new ministry, calling people to repentance, whatever it may be. And we find that the prophetic has a key um, result. Ezra 6, 15. The temple was completed on the third day of the month, Adar, in the sixth year of the reign of King Darius. We can date that precisely to 516 BC, exactly 70 years after the fall of Jerusalem. 
That's what Jeremiah prophesied. Let me take three more minutes and just try to um, reference a few more points. God called sensitiveness. We find in chapter 6. This whole sense, and it can seem odd to our modern ears, this idea of not marrying outside the people of God. God's call upon Christians is a call to live a life of distinctiveness. What does it mean for Woodies or whatever church you come from, what does it mean to Christ church to live a radically distinctive life so that the world in which we live notices? That's the challenge. We're not talking about intermarriage now. We're talking about today, what it means, what it looks like. And so often we have stayed shy of a really radical lifestyle which makes people notice. I love the old story about the mum who was disturbed in the night by the sound of a bump in her child's bedroom, came and found her little girl had fallen out of bed. And as she tucked this little girl back in and comforted her, she said, oh, darling, what happened? And the little girl just said, oh, mummy, I think I stayed too close to where I got in. And that's true of some of us in the church. You know, we've made our commitment to Jesus, but we've just stayed a little too close to where we came in. And actually, Christianity is a journey. We're always journeying deeper into the things of God. The teaching of Scripture is another thing we can find in Ezra 7. Uh, you can look at that. Ezra was chosen because he was a teacher well-versed in the law of Moses and so on. My next point was just the personal sacrifice by leaders. And I'll just reference that. I'm going to finish in a moment on the whole thing of leadership. Pray for your leaders. Acknowledging our dependency on the Lord. One thing again just to look out for. All the way through Ezra and Nehemiah. These two great leaders are continually saying, it's not me, it's him. It's not me, it's him. They humble themselves before the Lord. They acknowledge that the Lord is leading them. They acknowledge that without the Lord, nothing that they're building could ever come to be. I love one of Bill Johnson's little phrases. He talks about how in his early ministry, he wrestled with what you do when people come up to you at the end of a ministry time and say, that was great, thank you so much. And initially started saying, oh, no, 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 not at all. But then he realized that that was denying the testimony of those people in what was God was doing through him. So now do you know what he does? He simply says, thank you. And then as part of his nighttime discipline before he goes to sleep, he says this to God. He says, God, somebody gave me some things today that I think belong to you. Isn't that just wonderful? You know, if people praise you because of what you do for the Lord, don't deny it. Don't be falsely humble. Because to do that is to deny their testimony of what the Lord has done through you. But that night, sometime in the day, simply take it to the Lord and say, Lord, you know what? Some people gave me some things today that belong to you. Here they are. The power of humility. I've not got time to get into this, but uh, just to, because this may be significant at various times, the significance of confession and radical repentance. At the beginning of um, Ezra 10, um, Ezra is praying, confessing, is weeping, throwing himself down before the house of God, and people gather round him. I was really moved by the Willow Creek leadership in 2007, where they made their public declaration of where they thought they'd got things wrong in the way that they'd formed things. I just thought that was just the most extraordinary act of humility, and I know God will bless them for it. And here's where we end, because this was um, something I just wanted to draw us to a close in. It's from um, Ezra 10, 3 and 4. Ezra is confessing the sin of the people, and uh, one of the leaders of the people comes and says these words, let's make a covenant before our God to send away all these women and their children. Now, that sounds hard, but um, that's the context of the day. In accordance with the counsel of my Lord, and of those who fear the commands of our God. Let it be done according to the law. And then this is what they say to leadership. To me, this verse is such a beautiful description of leaders and people working together. And I just want to challenge you, wherever you go to church, wherever you are, is this the way that you are encouraging the leadership in your place? Rise up. This matter is in your hands. We will support you. So take courage and do it. I've had experiences where people have um, more often said, sit down, leave it to us. 
We're in control. Don't count on our support, especially if you make decisions we don't like. We're right behind you, but so we can look over your shoulder. Be cautious. Don't do anything. But I love what Ezra, what the people say here. I just want to encourage you, my final point, to get behind your leadership that God has anointed and appointed in the place where you worship. People who say to your leaders, rise up. This matter is in your hands. We will support you. So take courage and do it. There's such a wonderful sense of God's people, leaders and people working together in that one verse. You've been incredibly patient. You've listened to a great deal. I hope that you've got some sense of where Ezra fits into the great scheme of God's purposes in Scripture. And I hope together we've discovered some of the key markers of what it is to be God's healthy people, living in submission to his word, both written and rima, the prophetic word of God. And that from it we can learn and allow God to mold and shape us ever more into churches that, as your logo says, continually reproduce the life of Jesus. Because that's what our world needs. And we hold the hope for the world in the local church. Let's bow our heads to pray and then we'll hand back over to Dave and the band for a time of ministry. The ministry team have had some specific words that will be relevant and powerful and liberating to those who come in response. The word of God has um, sent out a challenge about sacrificial giving. Every member ministry that all are significant, about making worship a priority, about the significance of emotional reality, the prophetic, God's call to distinctive holiness, the personal sacrifice that we make, the power of humility, our willingness to be people who confess and make radical repentance, and the call to be leaders and people united and working together. And it may be that some of you, even now in your spirit, are responding to the work that the Lord now does as he completes the teaching for this evening. The human preacher never completes the sermon. The human preacher does what he or she senses the Lord has given. And when the human words stop, the work and the words of the Spirit continue. So Father, as your people, here in this place, gathered as were the people under Ezra thousands of years ago, we call upon you that you will pour out your spirit upon us tonight. That you will take from the teaching we've received the truth for each one of us. And that you will now begin to apply that word into the way that we live, that we might be remolded, reshaped, drawn closer to the image that you want us to be, that we might reflect into our world the glory and the goodness that is your character, your heart to bring the world back to yourself. Father, we praise you for the privilege of being alive in such days, days of turmoil and yet days of advance for the kingdom, days of great challenge and yet days where you are reawakening your church to the original purpose you gave to your son who passed it on to his followers with the aim that his church in every generation would continue to reproduce his life in power. Oh, Father, send your spirit now, we pray.